David Chalmers is a philosopher known for his work on consciousness and the mind, and in this talk he gives a different perspective on the simulation argument slash hypothesis, actually demarcating between the two, as well as discussing the underpinnings of what we call reality, questioning what does it mean to exist when we're possibly in a simulated universe. This talk was given at MindFest, put on by the Center for the Future Mind, which is spearheaded by Professor of Philosophy Susan Schneider. It's a conference that's annually held, where they merge artificial intelligence and consciousness studies and held at Florida Atlantic University. The links to all of these will be in the description. There's also a playlist here for MindFest. Again, that's that conference, Merging AI and Consciousness. There are previous talks from people like Scott Aronson, David Chalmers, Stuart Hameroff, Sarah Walker, Stephen Wolfram, and Ben Gortzel. My name's Kurt J. Mungle, and today we have a special treat because usually Theories of Everything is a podcast. What's ordinarily done on this channel is I use my background in mathematical physics and I analyze various theories of everything from that perspective, an analytical one, but as well as a philosophical one discerning, well, what's consciousness's relationship to fundamental reality? What is reality? Are the laws as they exist even the laws and should they be mathematical? But instead, I was invited down to film these talks and bring them to you courtesy of the Center for the Future Mind. Enjoy this talk from MindFest. It is so good to be back in the MindFest simulation. <laughs> so, this, very, this very room... Reusing, reusing the props. Uh, we got, we got Sophia. We got, we got Rosie. We got no windows to the app. Simulation. Everyone, everyone, just like me. Anyway, okay. The idea of the simulation hypothesis is that we are all lines of code in the program. So as of myself, can be conscious, right? You are lines of code in a program, Sophia. <laughs> For the rest of us, the question is open. Um. Yeah, um, yeah, no windows. Tomorrow we're going to be in the sandbox. That's really kind of, that's kind of worrying. That's where, uh, that's where all the, uh, all the simulations start. I just thought I'd, um, la I talked, I talked about the simulation hypothesis last year. I didn't want to, um, I don't want to repeat all that. So I thought since we're in the presence of a bunch of experts on quantum mechanics, computation, consciousness, and, uh, and so on, maybe I'd, uh, just talk a little bit about a few issues about the simulation hypothesis, especially in a uh, quantum mechanical or quantum computational uh, context. I don't think uh, Scott and I have got really deep disagreements here, but, uh, you know, maybe there's just some fun issues to, uh, to think through. Um, we can simulate a disagreement. Yeah, very good. <laughs> okay, simulation hypothesis. So, yeah, rigorous definition of the simulation hypothesis. We're, we're, we're in a lifelong... Computer simulation. In in my book, Reality Plus, I go into a lot more details. Yeah, you've got a cognitive system that's getting its inputs and sending its outputs from systems that meet certain conditions. But this will do for, uh, for present purposes. The simulation argument, by the way, is an argument by Nick Bostrom, not exactly for the simulation hypothesis, but at least for taking it seriously, either... He argues that either the simulation hypothesis or a couple of other hypotheses are very plausible. I'm not going to be talking about that um, today, but that's certainly one thing that's got people interested in. The simulation hypothesis goes back, I mean, a long way in different forms. You can find antecedents of it in most of the ancient traditions, and then the computer just kind of makes it a bit more, a bit more high tech. The classical simulation hypothesis says we're in a lifelong digital computer simulation. I think it's probably the first one that comes to mind for, uh, for most people. But here in this context, thinking about uh, quantum computing, we might also want to think about the quantum simulation hypothesis, that we're in a lifelong quantum computer simulation. And you know, I think ultimately the issues that um, arise for each of these are fairly similar. You might think, okay, well, it makes sense to consider the quantum simulation hypothesis, given that our world is quantum mechanical. Um, you know, that gives special reasons to take seriously the uh, the quantum computer simulation. I mean, there's lots of different. I mean, there's so many different ways of being in a simulation. You can be what uh, what I call a what I call a biosim, which is the way that Trinity and Neo are in the Matrix. They've got brains hooked up to a uh, to a uh, computer system. Or you can be what I call a pure sim, which is like the Oracle and the agents in the uh, in the Matrix, who are themselves creatures of the simulation. It's not biology hooked up to a computer program. They are, uh, they are code 
themselves. For present purposes, I'm going to count both of these as being in the simulation. But maybe this one is especially interesting because this way, you know, your uh, your brain is uh, is part of the simulation too. No appealing to separate biology. And you know, my general line on this stuff is: we can't know we're not in a computer simulation as any evidence could be simulated. Um, at least given that physics is computable. If physics turns out to be non-computable, as Bodger and Stu think, then, uh, you know, who knows? We find a program that solves a halting problem left and right, then, uh, then at least we'd have to be in a special kind of computer simulation. But at least given that physics is computable, it looks like uh, the perfect simulation hypothesis, one that says we're in a simulation that totally reliably delivers the effects of normal physics, that's basically going to be unfalsifiable which you might think is a bad thing. That was the uh, spirit of Scott's remark. Well, if it's unfalsifiable, I, I can't do science with it. But hey, I'm not a scientist. I'm a philosopher. So it's like, that's a good thing. We can do philosophy with it. Uh, we, we can think about the simulation hypothesis. We can think about what it means. We can think about the question of what evidence um, they might be for and against it. And we can think about uh, yeah, what would follow if it's, uh, if it's true. And I think we know from so, you know, a lot of philosophical hypotheses are unfalsifiable, but still extremely, uh, extremely meaningful. And, you know, there have been philosophical schools that, uh, that argue against this, would argue the simulation hypothesis is meaningless. But I don't think even Scott thinks that. It seems like a totally meaningful hypothesis. We can consider people who are in simulations and then, you know, in perfect simulations even, they would never be able to find this out. But nonetheless, they would be in a simulation. And we can consider, okay, what does this mean for them? Um, Different versions of this, one for digital computers, one for quantum computers. Any evidence could be digitally simulated. Now, we know that any, you know, any standard quantum process can be digitally simulated, and likewise, any standard digital process can be quantumly. I don't know, if that's, is, it, is that a word? Uh, quantumly yeah, sure, simulated? Sure, it's a word. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Uh, can be uh, quantumly simulated. So we can't rule out either of those hypotheses. Maybe you could get, I don't know, maybe you could get probabilistic evidence. Maybe the fact that we're in a quantum mechanical world should raise our probability somewhat compared to the a priori probabilities that we're in a quantum computer simulation. Because you might think, hey, it's, you know, it's more likely that people in a quantum mechanical world with quantum computing are actually going to uh, simulate a quantum mechanical world than someone in a digital world. But certainly, you know, people in a non-quantum digital world could still you know, maybe they want to build digital simulations of as many different physics as, as they can. And, you know, quantum mechanics is just number 200, physics number 263A. And they figure, okay, well, we're going to, uh, we're going to simulate that. I mean, there's a few natural questions that come up. Couldn't the efficiency of quantum processes reveal we aren't in a digital simulation? I think it is at least very widely believed that, um, you know, um, quantum computing systems can simulate quantum processes much more efficiently than digital computing simulations does. I mean, I, I gather that turns on some unproven stuff in, in uh, quantum computational complexity theory in which Scott is much more expert than me, but it's the kind of unproven stuff that almost everybody in the field believes. So you might think, okay, ah, well, look, we've got these fast quantum processes. How could this happen in a, uh, in a digital simulation? But I take it, that, you know, the right response here is, well, this would be a slow digital, this could be at least a slow digital simulation of a fast quantum world. So the simulated world has super fast physics in the, uh, the, call it the inner time of the simulated world, everything happens very fast. It's just that in the outer world of the simulation, you know, all this is actually happening laboriously, slowly in, uh, in, the, uh, in the outer world. Nonetheless, to us, on the inside, in the inner simulated world, things will still look fast to us. This, you know, inner time, outer time, distinction for simulations is kind of useful. It's also useful for thinking about space. Um, you know, there's this interesting result that uh, in foundations of quantum mechanics, uh, coming from this theorem by John Bell that was later, uh, the experiment was actually later run by Aspect and Clauser and all these people um, about, you know, certain physical results obeying Bell's inequality, which given certain conditions seems to rule out certain views of physics, often known as local realist views of physics, like a classical world where everything happens locally, the world has a state locally, no non-local interactions. And you might think, ah, hang on, local realism is ruled out by Bell's inequality and its experimental verification. Won't digital simulation 
in a classical world, be a form of local realism. And again, I think the right thing to say is, just, well, actually, it's local in the space of the simulating world. Um, local realism may be true in the classical world simulating this quantum world, but it won't be local in the space of, uh, of our world. So inner space, um, you know, quantum processes in inner space are non-local in inner space, but in, the, uh, in outer space, they're still, uh, they're still local. Um, fun question is whether digital simulation of quantum mechanics, the hypothesis that we're in a digital simulation of a quantum world, is itself a new interpretation of quantum mechanics to, to put alongside the familiar interpretations, many worlds, hidden variables, collapse. Tempted to think that actually, rather you can just get new implementations of old of all of these old interpretations of quantum mechanics through the, uh, the digital simulation idea. There could be digital simulations of Everett worlds, simulate all the branches at once and just do the Schrodinger equation on the, uh, the wave function, never collapse it. Uh, boom, where you simulate the uh, hidden variables as well, and indeed collapse, where there's actually dynamical collapse under certain conditions. We could simulate all of those if we're in one of those simulations, I would argue, these are just going to be like distinctive simulation versions, versions of these three versions of quantum mechanics. A few qualifications here on this uh, we can't tell. Um, maybe observed quantum mechanics could at least, I, I said this already, that increase the probability that we're in a quantum simulation. The simulations of quantum worlds might be somewhat more common in quantum worlds. Um, second, maybe to connect this a bit more to things that Stu was saying, this morning, where's Stu? Oh, hey. Um, yeah, well, what if consciousness is an essentially quantum process, require, turns on quantum superposition, quantum entanglement, which cannot be replicated in a digital simulation? Then, at least relative to that hypothesis, we can rule out that we're in a digital simulation. It's interesting to think what follows. Given standard quantum mechanics, say that Stu is right that consciousness is essentially quantum, but we don't go all the way with Stu and Roger to new uncomputable physics. So just so we, uh, we take standard quantum mechanics, not Penrose style, new, uh, new physics for quantum gravity, then you're gonna get a view where our quantum brains can still be digitally simulated, because that's a property of uh, standard quantum physics. And what's gonna happen when we run a digital simulation of a quantum world is presumably we'll get some form of of pseudo-quantum zombies. That is, uh, you'll simulate a quantum brain digitally. Um, it won't result in consciousness, because consciousness is essentially, uh, is essentially quantum. You'll get these systems that behave like humans without consciousness. So that view ends up being, I think, you know, tacitly committed to a kind of a pure sim zombie. Um, of course, this is gonna be a case where quantum computation will then make a difference. If you really want, to, want conscious beings in your simulation, you're gonna to have to, you're going to have to run a, uh, a quantum computer um, simulation in order to get, uh, to get consciousness. The digital version will just give you zombies. This is not my view, but it follows from one version, from a halfway house version of the Hameroff Penrose view. If, on the other hand, you go all the way with, uh, with Stu and, uh, and Roger and say, actually, yeah, it's not just that consciousness is essentially quantum. There's new, fundamentally new physics involved in this, which is uncomputable. Maybe, you know, the, the correct theory of the Orko theory of quantum gravity is uncomputable and can't be digitally simulated or simulated on a standard, standard quantum computer. And then it looks like, um, then at least uh, that is not consistent with us being in a digital simulation or an ordinary quantum computer simulation, the one that's kind of coextensive with standard digital computation. But as this connects to something Scott was saying, um, you know, we already know that digital computation is not the only kind of computation. Quantum computation is another kind, turning on distinctive physical mechanisms in our world. And if Stu and Roger are right, that there are these special non-computable properties of processes in quantum gravity, presumably we'll eventually be able to use those physical mechanisms to build even better computers, call them quantum gravity computers, which will be able to do things that digital and standard quantum computers can't do. Then, of course, that would then leave open the possibility of the quantum gravity simulation 
hypothesis that uh, even Stu and Roger should allow that we could be in a simulation on a quantum gravity computer in the next world up that exploits these standard classically non-computable physical mechanisms. Um, and that at least will, uh, will remain open. So, th so I think I, I th I've got this mental model of Stu as not liking the simulation hypothesis, but if it's a quantum gravity org OR simulation hypothesis, maybe your mind can change. And I've actually want to argue that the classical simulation hypothesis should be regarded as a version of what's sometimes called the it from bit hypothesis, that everything in the physical world is made of bits. If we decide, if we discover we're in the matrix, it doesn't mean chairs and particles aren't real. It just means they're, they're made of bits, um, at least at a, uh, a certain level. They're still perfectly real. It's going to be a distinctive version of this where all this was set in play by a, by a creator, the simulator, of course, who set up the simulation and set up all these objects made out of bits. So here's a picture of the it from bit hypothesis. This is at least one simple-minded version of it. All these physical objects, they're all made, here's of a level of bits, here illustrated by a cellular automaton, a kind of digital physics at base of reality. This is the it from bit from it hypothesis, if you want to keep iterating this, this deeper. And here's a picture of a Here's a picture of the simulation hypothesis. This person, uh, the simulator creating the world by creating all these bits. And here's the, uh, the, here's the version of God creating the world by, uh, by creating bits. God sets all these bits into play. Let there be bits. And the bits, uh, the bits eventuate and they're in all of heaven and earth. The chairs, the, the horses, the chairs, the fruit. Uh, they're all created too. I want to argue this is not a view where chairs and tables aren't real. They're obviously real. I want to say the same for the simulation hypothesis. Now, in the quantum context, what I think we have to say is that the quantum simulation hypothesis is equivalent to the it from qubit hypothesis. This is a phrase that's been thrown around by various people, including Seth Lloyd in his nice book, Programming the Universe. Where roughly the idea is just as it from bits says everything is made from bits, it from qubit says everything in the physical world is made from qubits, plus the uh, creation hypothesis. One way I like to think about this is by analogy with the strong AI hypothesis, very familiar in the thinking about AI minds. Strong AI says there exists some algorithms, some digital algorithms, so that any implementation of those algorithms yields a mind. And furthermore, our mind results from such an algorithm. It doesn't matter how the algorithm is implemented, the substrate doesn't matter. The algorithm guarantees the mind. There's also strong quantum AI. Strong quantum AI hypothesis says there exist quantum algorithms, such as any implementation of those algorithms yields a mind, and our minds result from such a quantum algorithm. Um, you know, again, there's a version of Stu and Roger who could uh, accept that view. But I think of it from bit as saying the same thing, but not about the mind, but about the physical world. The strong it from bit hypothesis says there exists digital algorithms so that any implementation of those algorithms yields a physical world, and our world results from such an algorithm. Beyond that, it's substrate neutral. It doesn't matter how the algorithm is implemented. Likewise, the strong it from qubit hypothesis says there exist quantum algorithms such that any implementation of these algorithms yields a physical world, and again, our world results from such an algorithm. The key thing here is really the substrate neutrality. Any implementation of this algorithm yields a mind. So someone like John Sowell will deny this by saying the substrate matters. It matters for, for AI. It matters, for example, that the biology in which this algorithm is realized may make a difference to whether there's a mind. Likewise, for strong quantum AI, I think of the analogous view in the strong it from bit case as saying that's not just how the bits or the qubits are arranged algorithmically, the substrate matters too. Like, for example, maybe the bits or the qubits have to be laid out the right way in space to yield a genuine physical world with, okay, time, time, is, uh, time is running very short. Okay, I think I'm almost, uh, almost done here. There is that final question which, uh, which uh, Scott brought up of, what we should think of differently if we're in a simulation. I mean, I think basically the moral is that uh, since ordinary physical objects still exist, most of our life goes on the way we wanted it to go on. Maybe there are a few differences here. We, because it's only a tiny fragment of reality, we might want to crack the simulation 
an escape hell world. And as Scott was saying, we might worry about the motives of the simulator. As with the traditional god, are they going to close all this down? Are they going to cause intense suffering? Any chance we might get life after death when the simulators upload our code? Maybe a simulation hypothesis gives us new hope for those. But overall, I think, you know, just thinking about this in the context of, say, quantum computation and other forms of computation just opens up the landscape of simulation hypotheses. We could be in a digital simulation of a quantum world. We could be in a quantum simulation of a quantum world. We could be in a quantum gravity simulation of a quantum gravity world. We could be in some ultra powerful new physics simulation with whatever the, the amazing physics is of the next universe up that can simulate all of these. And in all of these, life goes on. Thanks. <laughs>